for a safe delivery, a healthy baby, and a healthy mom. Thank the Lord for his goodness. Now, let's pray. Oh, Father, we come into your presence. We have sung our songs of praise. But on this morning where we focus specifically on the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave, I pray that you would speak to us now through your word. Make your living word speak, I pray. Make these lips of mine faithful and empowered by your spirit in expounding the good news of the gospel. And I pray that for every ear that hears, you would let them hear and trust and rest in the risen Jesus. I pray this in his name. Amen. Would you take your Bibles, please, and go back to John chapter 20, which the readers so excellently read for us. I want to read a few of those verses one more time. John chapter 20, verses 24 to 29. Follow along in your Bibles, if you will. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands, and put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. This is the word of the Lord. Now, one of the great, great Christian Easter stories of the Christian church in the last hundred years or so actually comes from the 1950s era and comes from communist Russia. It was an Easter Sunday morning, and one entire town was gathered together by the local communist party. And they were gathered in one particular auditorium, and they were gathered for the purpose of hearing a debate between a skilled communist speaker and a simple old man who served as the local Orthodox priest. Now, it was supposed to be a debate between a skilled academic and a simple country priest. And the communist speaker took the platform first and went through all the usual arguments that atheists use to try to disprove the Christian faith, and particularly on this occasion, trying to disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ physically from the grave. The arguments never change. You've heard the same ones he would have used back then. They've been around forever. But the speaker was dynamic, and he made his points with a flair. And when he was finished with his speech, so well had he done that he stopped, looked with a smirk over at the quiet elderly priest and said to him, now you go ahead and prove your risen Savior, if you can. And then he sat down in his chair as proud as a peacock. It wasn't a debate. This was going to be far too easy. It was a shellacking. The priest got up, stood behind the lectern, looked over at the crowd of people assembled before him, some of them he had known all of his life. He knew the sufferings that they had endured under communism. They'd been promised that 
a society without God would be far better than anything with God. They had been told that if they reject God and follow the Marxist philosophy, that they will have plenty of food, plenty of what they need, they will have justice, and they will have equality between people. They had been told over and over until they had memorized the words themselves, the saying of Marx that religion is the opiate of the people, a fantasy drug to to keep them stupefied and content with oppression. Well, these people had by now lived for almost 40 years under this communist system, they had experienced a world without God in action, and they had the scars to prove it. Well, the priest looked out over these people that he had cared about and uttered the simple words from the great Easter liturgy of the Orthodox Church, the Lord is risen. And the reply came back like thunder, almost shouted back with voices filled with the emotion from the audience that packed the room and the rafters nearly shook with the reply. They replied, he is risen indeed. And the debate came to an instant end. Well, this gospel of John that we've been reading from this morning begins back in chapter 1 by announcing one of John's great themes throughout his gospel. The light came into the world, and the darkness has never been able to extinguish it. And it's true. Think of the Soviet Union, the rise and the fall of Marxism there. Think of countries in the Muslim world today where it's illegal to convert to Christianity, and yet there are more people turning to Christ than ever before Think of the country of communist China right now, a country that's actively shutting down churches and putting pastors into prison for their faith. This very morning in the country of China, there are millions of Christians who are worshiping the risen Jesus Christ. Why? Because the light came into the world and the darkness has not overcome it. Well, in John's account of Easter, chapter 20 of his gospel, Sunday morning begins anywhere but in triumph. It begins in the darkness of anguish. The darkness does seem to have overcome the light of hope. Verse 1, you remember read, Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb to properly anoint her dead Jesus so that he may properly rest in peace. She comes with broken heart. Her Lord had been crucified, so naturally his body would be there in the borrowed tomb in which his body lay. See, none of Jesus' followers expected that he was actually going to die. Yeah, he he warned them that it was going to happen. In fact, explicitly so. He said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be crucified. And his disciples yet were were like our kids. They used selective hearing. Who, Who am I kidding? They were like all of us. We all use selective hearing. So when they saw their teacher, their leader, their hero and friend, hanging on that Roman cross, well, the bottom fell out of their world. They were crushed. It was over. Hope was gone. And that's why even after Mary saw the risen Jesus and shouted exuberantly to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, it wasn't enough. Verse 19 tells us that on the very first Easter Sunday, Where are the disciples? Well, they're huddled together, huddled together, inside a locked room. The doors are locked for fear of the Jews. You see, they saw what the leaders did to their Jesus. They are his disciples, so ipso facto, they are next in line. And so here, in this place of worry, is where they begin Easter. And yet it's into that place that the resurrected Jesus comes to them. 
The doors may be locked, but that doesn't stop the Lord from coming into them in a resurrected body that's not confined by the same limitations of the body before the cross. The disciples were here in this room. Actually, there was only 10 of the 12 original disciples here. Judas Iscariot, as you remember, had betrayed his Savior and then racked by guilt for his treachery towards the Master who had given him nothing but love and care for three years. That betrayer hung himself. Thomas is also not in the room on this day. We don't know why not. Was he sick? Did he have to work? Was there a playoff hockey game on TV? Or maybe his kid had a soccer tournament? The Bible doesn't tell us why Thomas wasn't with the others on that first Easter day. And I can't help coming to the conclusion that if he had been there, Thomas wouldn't have struggled so much with unbelief. Which, as an aside, is a little bonus lesson on the importance of being there in the mundane, week after week on Sunday at church. It may seem like nothing's going to happen, but you never know when the Lord is at work. Anyways, I'm not going to go down that road. The other ten disciples are there, and they are on cloud nine, verse 25. So they told him, it's the imperfect tense, they come to Thomas, they told him over and over again. Literally, they were saying to him, and they kept on saying to him, we have seen the Lord. He's alive. Thomas isn't persuaded. In fact, he's adamant. Verse 25, again, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my fingers into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will not believe couldn't get more skeptical than that. Now this morning, I want us to spend the rest of our time with Jesus' disciple Thomas. And if you've heard of Thomas, which many of you have, you've surely heard of his nickname. And on this side of eternity, he will, unfortunately for him, forever be known as Doubting Thomas. And in a society like ours today that prizes skepticism and is marked by a prove-it-to-me attitude, Thomas has become really a patron saint for, for all skeptics and doubters. In fact, I was visiting a church once not that long ago where the preacher said, Thomas is a hero for his doubt. There's all the disciples and then there's Thomas. He is especially great because he was skeptical. He doubted. Well, we'll see what Jesus thinks about that, but he does certainly speak for many today, and in a sense, you have to be skeptical today, don't you? So much of what you hear in the media, so much of what you see online, and even hear from officials in places of power, you find out later it's it's just not true. It comes with an agenda. And so if you're not at least a little skeptical of what you hear, you're going to be taken for a ride. Skepticism is not always bad, but where does Thomas's doubt come from? Where does doubt in general come from? When it comes to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave, or whether it's just Christianity in general, we've all met people, we've all talked to them, shared our faith, the good news of Jesus Christ, God's Son, the one Savior given to humanity. We've shared the transformation that Jesus Christ has made in our lives, the risen Savior. We've done it with delight. We've done it with love. We may not have been the most polished, but we've certainly come through with our passion. And the response that's come back from the person on the hearing end of our testimony is, oh, I'm so glad that you're able to have that faith. But I could never believe in that. So where does that doubt come from? Well, there are different kinds of doubt. There's the doubt of the emerging adult. She's been raised in a Christian home faithfully taken to church all through her growing years. She's heard all through life that there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, God's Son, and she believed it. Maybe she even got baptized as a young person, but then she goes off to university, and suddenly she's confronted by professors who find their greatest delight in knocking out the legs of the faithful, 
from all the young, impressionable students who naively come to their class thinking that these academics don't have any agenda. First-year philosophy classes are the worst. And everything she's believed in is not only attacked, but worse than that, it's laughed, it's mocked at, it's scoffed at and ridiculed. And she believes for the first time that she has been living all of her life so far riding on the coattails of her parents' faith. I don't know if I can believe in Christianity anymore, let alone the resurrected Jesus. That's one kind of doubt. Then there's also a different kind of doubt. It's the doubt of moral, deliberate choice. Aldous Huxley, who's famous for his work, A Brave New World, wrote another book entitled Ends and Means. And in it, he explains why he doubts Christianity. Listen to what he says. For myself, as no doubt for most of my contemporaries, The philosophy of meaninglessness was essentially an instrument of liberation. The liberation we desired was simultaneously liberation from a certain political and economic system and liberation from a certain system of morality. We objected to the morality because it interfered with our sexual freedom. We objected to the political and economic system because it was unjust. The supporters of these systems claimed that in some way they embodied the meaning, the Christian meaning, they insisted, of the world. There was an admirably simple method of confuting these people and at the same time justifying ourselves in our political and erotic revolt. We would deny that the world had any meaning whatsoever. That's the doubt of deliberate moral choice. There's also another kind of doubt. There is the doubt of a thousand little choices. It's the doubt of the man who lived all of his life in the church. He professed faith in Christ. He has been baptized. He was a member of the church for years and years, taught Sunday school, led a Bible study even, maybe even trotted around the world speaking to crowds. But as life gets more and more hectic and as the business and promising career pressures mount ever heavier upon his shoulders, something's got to give. So personal devotions become more and more dry Prayer time becomes less and less frequent. Accountability with other Christians within a church family fades and fades. And over the course of time, he just starts to feel, you know, I just don't connect with anyone at church anymore. I don't have anything in common with the people there. I'm going to build my life in relationships with people outside the church. And along that same road, a hundred thousand little choices later, maybe five years down the line, maybe ten years down the line, that very man wakes up in a comfortable career with a comfortable bank account, driving the car he's dreamed of owning for years, but he's barely darkened the door of the church in years. And he says, you know, I don't even think I can believe that Christian stuff anymore. Friend, never underestimate the power of the little choices that you make day after day after day in a thousand little ways. Those little choices add up to a great determination on your spiritual destiny. Well, Thomas's doubt doesn't come from any of those factors. So where does it come from? Well, if you read verses 24 and 25 carefully, the Bible lets us in a little bit into Thomas's frame of mind. Thomas describes Jesus' wounds there. Did you see? Because Thomas was there, remember? He watched Friday's events. He was at a safe distance, yes, but he was there, and he saw it with his own eyes. And you may not be aware of this, but in crucifixion, It isn't the loss of the blood of the individual that kills them. It's suffocation. That's how they die. 
They're hanging by hands and feet. The only way to breathe is to push up on the feet and pull up with the hands and take a breath. It is gruesome and it can go on for days. And in some times, some cases like Jesus' death, for example, the authorities wanted the job done quickly. It was Passover. It was a Jewish holy feast coming up and the religious leaders wanted that body off of the cross before Passover came So in cases like that, Roman soldiers will go along with a club and they'll smash the prisoner's legs. Once the prisoner's legs are broken, then you can't push up to catch your breath anymore, so you suffocate in a matter of minutes. It's a horrific, painful, excruciating death. And yet when the soldiers came back to Jesus to check on him, they noticed that he had already been deceased. So just to be sure, in an extremely rare act, one of the soldiers takes a sword with his hand and rams the point of the sword right into the Savior's side. And yep, just as he thought, blood and water came spewing out, proof that Jesus was indeed already dead. I saw that with my own eyes, Thomas says. I was there when they pounded the nails into his wrists. I watched him suffer. I I saw the spear pierce his side. and, And I saw the fluid come pouring out. And then I watched as my only hope, the one in whom I had put all of my trust for my future, I saw my hope pulled down lifeless from the cross and carried into a then sealed tomb. He had such high hopes that that Jesus was the Messiah, that he had actually finally been sent by God to rescue his people. He'd invested three years of his life listening to him, walking with him, learning from him, learning to trust him with all of his hopes, and now, now he's dead. And dead people don't rise in first century Judea or 21st century Abbotsford. Hope is gone. See, Thomas' doubt is the doubt that rises out of deep disappointment and fear of being disappointed again. And I know there are people watching right now, there are people here in this room right now, and maybe you feel like you've been there. You heard a promise, maybe it was from a friend, maybe it was from a preacher on TV. They said, God really does love you and he has a wonderful plan for your life and if you just come to Jesus and put your trust in him, you give to a television preacher, then you know what? God's going to bless your socks off with health and wealth and all the girls will fall o- fawn over you, young men. Jesus will cover your pathway with rose petals and you believed it. But things haven't turned out the way that you expected. Life's been hard. You know disappointment. You know deep disappointment. People here today, You've lost someone you dearly love. A parent. My parents have been gone almost 18 years and it still hurts. You lost a spouse. You lost a child even. And now, if you're honest, you'll admit that you have a hard time. You have a hard time trusting in God's goodness when you have suffered like this. You have a hard time learning to surrender everything to Jesus Christ and seeking first his kingdom and righteousness, trusting that all of these things will be added unto you as well. Well, that part you don't really believe anymore, truth be told, because you're afraid of being had. See, that's Thomas. That's Thomas. Unless I have incontrovertible proof that what you have claimed to see is not a ghost, not a figment of your imagination, but is really the same person that I saw pierced by nails and spear, unless I see it and touch it, I will not believe. I will not be sucked in again. Well, eight days pass from Easter Sunday. The disciples are gathered together with fresh reason for worship. 
Ten of them have seen the risen Jesus. But verse 26 tells us the doors are still locked. So they're still a little bit living in Friday's fear, aren't they? Verse 26 goes on to tell us that even though the doors are locked, Jesus stands among them and he says, peace be with you. Peace be with you. That's a critically important biblical idea, that word peace. It's God's intention for his kingdom. The Hebrew word is shalom. And shalom, peace, it doesn't mean the absence of warfare and violence only. Too many people read that word peace in the Bible and thinks it only carries that negative sense of what's missing, what's absent. No more pain, no more warfare. But that's too small of an idea to capture the full sense of God's intention here. Shalom is the picture of a perfect, unhindered well-being. It's a picture of wholeness. And Jesus comes to his disciples and he says to them, trembling in fear, peace be with you because his resurrection guarantees that when Jesus on the cross cried out, it is finished, then it really was finished. Every sin of all of his people for all time have been paid for. Perfect righteousness before the holy judge of heaven has been bought for all of his people. The work is done. It is finished. Now there's peace. And as soon as Jesus greets the 11 in verse 27, he turns to one doubting disciple and he speaks to him. You know who I'm talking about. Verse 27, Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Now, do you notice anything strange here? Thomas hasn't actually said anything to Jesus about his skepticism. When he told his doubts to his companions, Jesus wasn't anywhere in sight. So see the the sovereign grace of Jesus Christ. He knows the secret words. He knows the inner hearts of his disciples. And he comes to Thomas with patience. And he stoops to him in his weakness. And he says to this doubting, skeptical disciple, you need to see and touch. Well, here I am. Here I am. Here are my wounds. They're not even healed yet. Go ahead and touch and know that it is really me, physically alive. Well, after all the fussing about his list of demands before he could ever believe, you'd think that at this very moment, Thomas would do just that, what Jesus invited him to do, that out would go his hand and the now scarred over wounds would be touched by his hand and his fingers and finally he could get the proof that he demanded. But he doesn't do that. Did you notice that? No, what does Thomas do? Immediately to the ground on his knees he drops and he worships my Lord and my God. Now this is a tough one for the Jehovah's Witnesses. In case you're not aware, Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe that Jesus really is God. He's a created being. So when you hear the knock on your door and you open up, eager to share the good news with your friendly visitors and neighbors. You pull out your Bible, you turn to this passage in John chapter 20 and say, ha ha, look here, look here. Thomas said it, my Lord and my God. Well, they will respond with one of two answers. Either they will say that Jesus, that Thomas is speaking to two different people. My Lord, he's addressing Jesus, and my God, he's speaking to God the Father. So my Lord and my God. Or the other option they'll give you is that Thomas is so stunned, so surprised that the living Jesus really is standing in front of him that he bursts out with an exclamation very popular in our culture today. My Lord and my God. He's blaspheming. He's taking the Lord's name in vain, breaking the third commandment. Drops to his knees and swears. And Jesus then blesses Thomas for it, blesses him for blaspheming. So Jesus condones blasphemy and encourages idol worship. Well, I'm sorry, that's where I'm a little skeptical because that makes no sense to me. 
my Lord and my God. This is worship. Remember, this isn't the first dead person Thomas has seen arisen from the dead. He was there when Jesus called Lazarus out of the tomb after four days of being wrapped up and starting to stink. Thomas has been wrestling with the whole idea. Resurrection. It can't be. Now he sees Jesus. He saw Lazarus. He didn't drop to his knees in worship. But here he is in worship. Because after wrestling, after wrestling, he's come to the right conclusion. He can't help it. He's right in front of him. For the last three years, the scenes that he has been involved in with Jesus, in this past week plus, they've been coming back into his mind. Jesus, there, remember, forgiving sins, and then attacked by the religious leaders of the day. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Well, they were right. Nobody can forgive sins but God, yet Jesus never corrected them. And yet he continued to forgive sins. And then there was a time when they were in the boat on the sea when the storm rose up and almost killed them all. Jesus says two simple words of command. Peace, be still. That's two words in Greek. And the storm instantly stops, dead, and the sea is instant glass. Who is this that, that even the wind and the waves obey him? And then there's this scene that comes to mind where Jesus is casting out demons from legion, sending them with a word of command out of a man they had possessed and oppressed. He raises the dead Authority over death and the forces of darkness. Suddenly, in Thomas's mind, it all makes sense. This is not just a political Messiah. This is God. It has to be God. And here's where Jesus gets firm. Thomas has made the right decision, the right confession. But Jesus gives him a little slap on the wrist. Did you notice that in verse 29? Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Hmm. What does that mean? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Is Jesus saying here that your faith is better if you don't need any evidence? Is Jesus praising the gullible here? You know people, you know people that are like the Queen of Hearts in Alice in Wonderland. Sometimes I believe as many as six impossible things before breakfast. Is Jesus praising that? No, he's not praising the gullible. And that's where verses 30 and 31 come in. Let's take a look there. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. These are written so that you may believe and by believing, you may have life in his name. Unfortunately, on this very moment, this very morning, in our own corner of the province of BC, there will be churches that are preaching, pastors speaking right now, where he will stand behind his pulpit and he'll say, you know, we can't really know that Jesus actually physically rose from the dead? We can't know that these legends really are true written here in this book. After all, we are scientifically educated, sophisticated citizens of an intellectually enlightened age. But you know, that's not really the point of Easter anyways, because we believe in the spirit of Easter Christianity. We believe in new beginnings. We believe in fresh starts that inspire us to pursue the teachings of this Jesus who was such a great teacher. We are inspired through Easter to pursue equality and justice for all, the golden rule and love and peace and, and all of those other warm and fuzzy things. And friends, if that's what you came here looking for today at this service, you're not going to find it here. 
Because what John is pointing to in our text is the fact that you must encounter the physically risen Jesus Christ. Without the resurrection, then all of the great teachings, all of the morals of Christianity, all of its best efforts make no sense in the end. Because the dead are dead. I know some of you here this morning are students. Some of you are facing exams and the pressure that goes along with them over the course of the next couple of weeks. I've heard some of your terror stories. I've, I've seen some of you sweating. Well, let's say that you have a final exam coming up in a couple of weeks. And there are two groups of you. are divided into two groups facing the same three-hour exam. Now, suppose the professor goes to half of you and says, okay, this is what's going to happen. You're going to study, you're going to write the three-hour exam, and then you're going to hand it in to me. And after all of your study, all of your writing, I'm going to take your papers that you write down on, and I'm going to rip them into pieces, and I'm going to throw them into the garbage after all the time you spent studying. And then the professor goes to the other group and says, Okay, here's what's going to happen for you. You're going to write the exam, you're going to hand it in, and then I'm going to take your papers, I'm going to grade the exam, and this exam is going to be the basis for which university you end up in, which career you get into, the job that you will finally get, and the people that you will meet for the rest of your lives. In other words, this exam for you will determine the course of the rest of your life. Now let me ask you something. Do you think there's going to be a difference between the two groups in terms of their motivation to prepare for that exam? Man, when I had pressures for exams that really did mean something, I had a hard enough time getting motivated to study. Imagine if you were told ahead of time your exam's going to be taken and thrown into the garbage. Work as hard as you can, but ultimately, it's going to make no difference. Your life is ultimately meaningless. It's all going to end up in the trash. Or it's going to make all the difference in the world to you because there is a future after it. Do you see the connection here with the resurrection of Jesus? If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then there is no real physical life after the grave. So when you die, you rot then all the teachings of Jesus are ultimately meaningless and there is no hope. John is saying that there is evidence to support faith in a living Jesus whose resurrection guarantees that everyone who puts their trust in his finished work as their only hope will share in his resurrection with the same kind of body and will live in eternal joy in his glorious presence. And what is that evidence? The evidence is the testimony of the apostles. Back to verse 30, 31. These are written. These things are written that you may believe and that by believing you may have life in his name. And that's where the New Testament comes in, friend. The New Testament is the written testimony, the evidence of the apostles' eyewitness testimony. You may not realize it, but this New Testament is almost exclusively the testimony of those who had seen the risen Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Mark was the protege of Peter. Paul, he met the risen Jesus on the way to Damascus where he was stomping his feet on his bloodthirsty campaign to stop once and for all the followers of Jesus and their message that he is God's Savior, the risen Lord. And when we follow these witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus, in the days and years following John chapter 20, you can see how tenaciously they held to the message that Jesus Christ has been bodily, visibly, physically raised to glory. Remember the night when Judas and his armed thugs came into the garden to arrest Jesus? Thursday night. What did these disciples do? Ran for cover. Later that same night, Jesus is on trial. Peter is denying, not once, not twice, not even three times. He's denied, or it is three times. Three times he denies that he even knows Jesus. 
And on Sunday, after the resurrection, even after seeing him, these disciples are still hiding in a locked room, still in terror of the authorities of the day. These are not naturally brave people. And yet after John 20, and particularly after Jesus sends the Holy Spirit, these same cowards start sharing out loud. They start proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus to the point of death. Do you realize that every one of these apostles, except for John, died as martyrs for preaching the message that Jesus has risen from the grave? And John himself, he may not have been martyred, but he lived his last days in exile on a deserted island prison for the very same reason. Something transformed them. Jesus Christ is risen, and we cannot stop sharing the good news that no matter what you do to us, we will keep sharing because the resurrection of Jesus changes everything. Nothing else matters. Can you believe them? Well, Chuck Colson, who was Richard Nixon's special counsel, who ended up going to prison for his role in the Watergate scandal, said something that's worth considering. He said, I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured if that, that if it were not true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. Well, tradition tells us that Thomas became a missionary. Then he went to Parthia, then Persia, and then he took the gospel to the country of India, going ashore at Kerala in the southwest. Thomas was martyred there, but not before planting churches of Christians that are still in existence today, Thomas churches that believe the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave. In fact, within the space of three centuries, these once cowering, fearful 11 men and the women with them turned the entire Roman Empire upside down. Do you see the difference that a personal relationship with the risen Jesus makes? It will take your life and it will take you from fear to faith and courage and purpose and hope and fearlessness. So as we close, let me ask you, do you know him personally, the risen Jesus? Let's close with 1 Peter 1, starting at verse 3. If you've got your Bibles, turn there real quick. This is a place we need to end. 1 Peter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ." Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. He is risen. Father, thank you for the gift of your son. And thank you for the hope that resurrection brings. Jesus is alive. 
having paid the penalty for our sins, having earned a righteousness to give to us, he has risen triumphant from the grave physically, our hope for our future, for our eternity, and we thank you for your indescribable gift. And if there are those within the sound of my voice this morning who have not had a personal encounter with the living, risen Jesus, oh, would you do your work by your spirit and bring them to that place of surrender and faith and joy. Lord, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.